Hello chess fans, we are going to have a look at a very special game played by world's best player Magnus Carlsen and hopefully this game is going to change your perception on how chess is supposed to be played. It's super instructive and I would like to go through the ins and outs with you to, uh, together. Magnus Carlsen is playing with the white pieces against a strong grandmaster from uh, Moldova, Ivan uh, Shitko. And the two have played against each other before. Both games ended in a draw. Big disappointment for, uh, for Magnus, of course, as he is about 300 points higher rated than his opponent. But probably that also means that he is out on uh, revenge. Well, anyway, hopefully this game will give you a lot of new insights, will deepen your understanding as quite a number of uh, hidden ideas of chess strategy that are being revealed in this game. So if you do like this video and many of my other videos about this 45th Olympiad in Budapest, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to do that. I really need your help to, uh, to be able to make more videos um, uh, to make in the, in the future. So anyway, let's dive straight into the action. Magnus opens the game with 1d4. d5, knight f3, knight f6, e3. And after bishop f5, c4, c6, we have the Slav defense, typically with the pawn on c6, knight c3, e6, knight h4. Very typical idea. It's a well-known opening line as white is trying to get uh, black's light squared bishop to claim the advantage of the bishop pair. Now black first goes for the move bishop e4. So white attacks the bishop with the move f3. Bishop goes back to g6. And here the queen comes to b3 to attack the pawn on b7, queen c7 played. And here you can see that white of course has ideas to take on g6 already now. But once you do take back with the h-pawn, the h-file will be opened. And together with the rook and the queen, the pawn on h2 may get into some sort of trouble. So white is not in a rush here to take the, pawn, uh, to take the bishop on uh, g6. Bishop d2 played and black goes for the move a5. So I guess the idea is that in certain cases you would like to play the move a4, although I'm not sure if that's a really an, a possibility now. Anyway, white decided here to take on d5 and black takes back with the knight. And white plays the move g3. Another pawn move while the bishop is still on its initial square and also the king and the uh, two rooks in the corner. Why is this move so useful? Well, for various reasons, actually. Um, after knight d7, White goes for the move e4 to attack the knight. Knight takes c3, pawn takes uh, c3, and white does have a beautiful pawn center, but obviously he needs still to do something about his uh, development. Black goes for the move b5, and uh, well, there are various, various ideas here. Now, Magnus goes for this move, a3. He wants to... Uh, uh, be able to drop back with the queen maybe to a2 in case um, black is going to attack it. That could be one idea. It's not really clear if this move was, was needed at all. But some ideas are going to be re revealed uh, very soon. As black played here, the move bishop e7 does look like a logical move to attack the knight on h4. But now knight takes g6, h takes g6. And you see that thanks to the pawn on g3, the pawn on h2 is not attacked by the queen. In any case, white played here, very interesting idea. If you do play these systems, you will recognize uh, white's move immediately. King f2. So white is not going to castle, but placing the king on f2, guarding the pawns on uh, f3 and g3 does give white somewhat more uh, stability. And you also consciously keep your rook on the h-file, because for instance, if... Black is going to castle any time. Could have been done some uh, moves earlier, of course, or for instance now. But then white has the plan to go for the move h4, to play h5, to open up the h-file for the rook and eventually try to attack the black king. Here you can see that the king on f2 is nicely defending the pawn on uh, g3. So therefore, black also has to make some kind of an annoying uh, decision what to do with the king. You would like to complete your development, but now having advanced your pawns on the queen side, castling queen side is also no longer attractive. Castling king side also not. So for now, the king got to stay in the center. Black goes for the move, rook b8. Eyeing the queen on the b-file. Of course, the pawn is there on, uh, on b5. But everything is uh, well protected and white is not able to uh, break through yet. So white first 
does what he needs to do step by step further strengthening his position bishop e2 now the rooks are nicely connected and white can decide on which side of the board he wants to play g5 played bishop goes to e3 so here the bishop is obviously a bit better placed better protecting the pawn on uh, d4 perhaps opening up the d file for the rook later anyway knight b6 played looks like a solid square for the knight and white brings the king to g2 so the king looks like it has normally uh, ca castled in a normal way. Uh, I do like white's uh, pawn formation. Uh, it does offer white more space. But here it's a very instructive moment because because of that space advantage, usually the space behind that pawn chain is quite vulnerable. And especially if, imagine, the, the, the center, the position will be opened and black can get access to the to the white king there may be some sort of counterplay now in the game um Shitko was struggling to come up with a with a good move he, he played king f8 he didn't want to castle he played uh, his king there uh keeping the rook on the h file but i want to show you a super instructive idea which is pointed out by the machine but it's something i would not have uh, considered myself but let's quickly go through this idea black can play here a move like e5 opening the position normally favors the side with the two bishops but here the point is that after pawn takes e5 black can go for the move knight c4 to attack the bishop on e3 uh, be ready to regain the pawn on e5 with with more active possibilities and the tactical justification is in the following line as let's say white whips off the knight on c4 and captures a second pawn then the rook can enter via this open file giving a check look at the other rook on h2 all of a sudden black's pieces are becoming super active if you try to guard your king then the queen can come to b6 with an attack on the bishop if you defend with the rook then the bishop comes to c5 tremendous pressure exerted by black's pieces now the best line here is rook a2 take everything on f2 looks as if white is winning but at the end of the day there is this tactical strike with rook takes h2 king takes queen takes f2 and black is having enough resources to keep a draw as the the, the king is is quite vulnerable there are a bunch of checks uh, coming up uh, soon so now this line is impossible to see from afar but i think it nicely shows you that once the position gets opened white is also quite vulnerable uh, with his king but you need to act pretty fast with uh, with black and the move king f8 is a pretty slow move it does give white time to consolidate his own position rook hf1 was played and that's a good move because here the rook is potentially guarding his own king but also looking for other ideas after king g8 the king is now safer the rook is still on the h file the rook comes to f2 so here you see why Magnus is consolidating his second rank. Never give the enemy's major pieces a chance to attack your king. Still, quite a complicated position. I do fancy White's uh, prospects here still. Probably a move like e5 is, is worth investigating, but Black played here this move, knight d7 back. But that's also a clear admission that Shitko is struggling to come up with an active plan. Maybe against the weaker player, he would have tried to play more actively, taking more risks. But uh, against stronger players, people usually tend to stay as solid as possible and let the opponent, uh, the stronger player, uh, try to uh, prove something. Here, Magnus seizes the initiative with the move f4 very nice move as he is about to open up the uh, the f file for the rook pawn takes f4 bishop takes f4 attacking the queen and the rook and now the key point that's very important to mention was not played in the game but black is not able here to play e5 it opens up the diagonal for the queen on b3 and there's this beautiful blow queen takes f7 king takes f7 there's bishop takes e5 and after this queen sacrifice white is going to regain, regain uh, the queen by uh, taking on c7 next so white will be up two pawns e5 not possible black played bishop d6 offering the exchange of bishops now e5 is played attacking the bishop on d6 bishop e7 and now the bishop comes to g4 all of a sudden white is grabbing more space and his pieces are coming alive this bishop is looking fantastic here with 
for instance, the idea that if you do play a move like uh, c5, there is bishop takes e6. And if you do take, it's queen takes e6 with a massive attack against uh, the king. If you go king f8, bishop g5, white is uh, crashing uh, through here. So bishop takes e6 is a huge threat. Black played the move a4, attacking the queen, but the queen stays on the diagonal. Very good move. So maintaining pressure against that pawn on e6. Therefore, black dropped back with a knight to f8, defending the pawn on e6. Rook a f1. And now, here you see all white pieces are working fantastically together. The rooks are eyeing that weakness on f7. That is actually quite difficult to, uh, to defend. Well, black played here, did move rook to h7, so that the rook is ready to defend the pawn on uh, f7 by playing his uh, g pawn uh, forward. Well, white played h4, nice idea, grabbing more space. And uh, well, here, after the move queen d8, there's not much uh, else black can, uh, can do. For instance, a move like c5 will always be countered by, uh, by d5. And uh, step by step, white is getting more access to the, to the black uh, king. Queen d8 played, bishop e3. Here you see the rooks are hitting that pawn on uh, f7. What should um, black do? That's very difficult to say. I was thinking g6 is a logical move. But in that case, I would propose the move bishop f3 to attack the pawn. And after queen d7, bishop e4. The bishops are working fantastically. Knight on f8, f8 is stuck. White can shift the attention to the king side. Rooks are doing fantastic job there. The queen can come over as well. There are plans to go h5 at the, at the right moment to pin, uh, to attack the pinned pawn on um, g6. Well, if you ever take with the rook, then f7 will drop. So, so many problems to deal with. Anyway, g6 not played. Black played g5, looking for active counterplay. Like if you do take, the bishop can take back and therefore the queen is on d8 to uh, be ready to recapture on g5. But white keeps the pawn on the board. h5, it's a passed pawn, but most importantly, it prevents the knight from coming to an uh, active square. Black goes for queen d5 check, offering the exchange of queens. And white can take himself now on d5. But bishop f3 is the move played by Magnus. I like this rerouting of uh, the bishop attacking the queen. Queen takes a2, rook takes a2. The rook also keeps the pawn weakness on a3 defended. Bishop is now hitting the pawn on c6. Rook c8, defending the pawn. And now another classy move. White is not in a rush. First place here, the move g4 to protect that pawn on h5, preparing the bishop to come to e4 to hit the rook. Let's say if black ignores it, plays c5, you go bishop e4, then the rook is in trouble. If you go rook g7, there's h6, the rook doesn't have a square to go to. And instead, if you put the rook on h6, then the rook swings back all the way to f2 to attack the pawn on f7, after which the bishop on e7 is also gonna, gonna hang. So, Bishop e4 is a huge threat. Black played here the move f5, looking for a way to fight back. But white is capturing en passant. Bishop takes, and here it is, bishop to e4. Hitting the rook, hitting the bishop on f6. Black got to defend both pieces. Well, if you do play rook f7, it's rook a f2, and the rook on f7 is in trouble. Let's say you go knight d7 to defend the bishop. It's bishop takes g5. Black's bishop can't take as it hangs the rook on f7. Therefore, the rook has to go to h6 to defend the bishop from the side. Rook a f2 attacking the uh, bishop on f6. King g7 is now possible. Looks as if everything is perfectly defended. But look at this. White just played here the move king to g3. And that's maybe not a move you uh, would have played yourself. Maybe you were struggling here to find a way to break through. But then the key idea, the key approach here is to look at the position from your opponent's perspective. What is black going to do in this position? And if, when we study the position, we do see quite a lot of problems. The rook on h6 cannot move. It has to keep the bishop defended. The bishop cannot go away because then the rook will come to f7. If you play a move like knight h7, for instance, there is bishop takes h7, and you can't take with either the king or the rook because it hangs the bishop on uh, f6. 
So that is not possible. If you put a knight on d7, which looks like the most natural move, this knight is unprotected. And Magnus had seen, of course, a nice little tactic in advance. Knight d7 was not played, but very important to understand that bishop takes g5 is possible here. If you do take back, it's rook f7, the rook enters with a devastating effect. The other rook will come very soon as well. Why does a pawn up crashing uh, position here? So there are no good moves. Even if you try a pawn break, like e5, the rook will come into f5. The pawn is no longer preventing the rook from coming to that square and the pawn on g5 will be lost. So all of a sudden, there are so many problems here. The rook on c8 got to keep the pawn defended, cannot move somewhere along the 8th rank. Rook c7 was played, but that move has also a huge drawback. As here, Magnus finds a way to break through with bishop takes g5. Grabbing a pawn, as after bishop takes, there is rook takes f8, and that rook, which was on c8, is no longer defending that knight on f8. Here, rook h8 was played. Black is trying to swap rooks. If that happens, let's say rook takes rook, king takes rook. If more rooks are coming off the board, we do get an opposite colored bishop endgame. And with opposite colored bishop endgames, we know that there's a pretty high draw tendency, so it will be difficult to win. However, in this case, there are still rooks on the board and the presence of rooks always favors the side with the initiative. And white is a pawn up. His pieces are more active and Magnus is playing for an attack against the black king. He played here fantastic move, h6. It's not really a pawn sacrifice. You cannot simply take the pawn there because it runs into rook h1. It's a pin. The only way to defend is king to g7. But then... Beautiful tactic, g5 attacking the bishop. If you do take, then the rook enters on h7 with check. After king g8 is rook takes c7, it's game over. So here you see that thanks to the move h6, that pawn cannot be taken, but white is threatening checkmate in one. If you block that square with your king, the pawn comes to h7 with check. If you go king g7, it's rook f8. The rook supports the advance of the h-pawn to become a queen. If you take the rook, it's h8, queen, game over. Black played here, bishop e7. And uh, now the bishop is controlling the f8 square. You can't really enter here yet with your rook because there's always bishop d6 check. And then the rook on f7 will be taken, but white is not in a rush. Played here the move g5, and once again, the pawn is poisoned. If you do take it, it's rook f8 with that mating pattern I've mentioned already. And otherwise, the pawn is just coming to g6. Well, black didn't want to wait any longer, resigned here. Because, let's say, if you play something like bishop takes a3, it is g6. These two co connected past pawns, they're just incredibly strong. If you go back with the bishop, then the only thing you should avoid is, let's say, rook f7. Because there's bishop d6 and, well, all of a sudden there's hope for black to survive. But you can move the king. You're not in a rush. And uh, that a pawn is uh, not dangerous at all. If you push it, then the rook comes to f7. That's a good move. Bishop d6, offering the exchange of rooks. g7, king g8. And now you can just advance the other pawn as well. h7 with check. The rook can be taken, but then you get a new queen. This is just a sample of how quickly black's position can, uh, can fall apart. So... That was an absolute masterpiece by Magnus Carlsen. I like the calmness of his moves. I like how he takes care of his uh, space advantage, which means that you also take responsibility for the weaknesses created within your own camp. Fantastic piece configuration by White in the middle game. I think this game deserves even more study. So uh, don't mind to watch this video a second time if you uh, want. Well, thanks for watching. Let me know in the comments what do you think of this game. Maybe it was Magnus' his best game of the year. In any case, thanks for watching once again. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and more to come.